This gospel requires much more interest and much more commentary than we have time to look at in this brief period this morning, but a few comments about it. The mother of Jesus goes, uh, the mother of James and John, she goes to Jesus to ask a favor. One of her sons will be on the right and one on the left. Clearly her, her understanding and their understanding of the kingdom of God is a worldly triumph. If you read Mark's gospel, this appears in Mark. It doesn't interest me. It doesn't appear in Luke, uh, nor in John, but it does appear in Mark, and Mark is the earliest of the gospels. So Matthew certainly took his stories from Mark. Mark, however, has James and John going to Jesus and asking for the same favor themselves. Matthew is a little bit more gentle. He has their mother going to ask for them. It does raise some questions about who, these, who the disciples are that Jesus has chosen. You know, uh, in Shakespeare's King Lear, the elderly befuddled king uh, is worried because his two daughters, Regan and Goneril, are trying to cut back on his entourage to undermine him. And Goneril will give him 50 servants, cut back to 50. Regan, just 25. So he chooses Goneril. With this remark, he said, not being the worst ranks in some place of praise. And in many ways, I thought, um, in a way, Jesus didn't select the best, and he didn't select the worst. He seems to have selected for his followers the average. That's like the rest of us. We're not the best, we're not the worst, we're just in the middle somewhere. And you'll find this, that the reason his disciples followed him in the first place was not entirely ideal. It wasn't um, driven by sacrifice or suffering or the servant being the servant of others. It was somehow motivated by ambition. Uh, they thought that Jesus would establish a worldly kingdom, and that's why they followed him. So when he announces his passion, and here in chapter 20, going up to Jerusalem, this is the second prediction of his passion. He already told them that he would suffer and he would die and rise. And now he tells them a second time, but they do not hear him because they do not want a suffering Messiah. They want a triumphant Messiah. And they're average people. They're looking for some promotion. They're looking for some benefit. They don't want to follow Jesus in order to suffer. And yet, Jerusalem, biblically, Jerusalem is the place of destiny. That's the place where life really comes into focus and where life has meaning. And it does involve suffering. It does involve dying and it does involve being born to a new life. That's a hard lesson for us to learn in many ways, you know. In the economy of life, our tendency is to look for the most favorable, um, the most successful. Uh, whatever promotes our self-interest seems to be a primary interest. But when you come to the kingdom of God, it has a different sense of value. The value is somehow governed by what we can give, not what we can get. It's governed by something deep and profound inside of us that says, my life is more meaningful when I give, when I suffer for others, when I sacrifice for others. That's a difficult enough lesson to learn. Even when we look at the church, we're looking for a triumphant, powerful church. We're looking for a parish that's usually alive. 
<laughs> now there's a lot of conversation going around here at Holy Family about this new pastor that's coming in and God knows what happens if we change. Oh my goodness, what would happen if we had to suffer and what would happen if we had to make sacrifice and we had to change? We get so used to what we have. We're fearful about change. We have opinions. We have sometimes strong opinions about the church or about anything else. Change is difficult. And that's exactly what happens here. They have ideas. This is what they want. This is why they follow Jesus. And now they get a different agenda. And now they reject that. They don't hear Jesus telling them they must suffer and they must serve others. The whole call of discipleship is to serve others. I've often wondered what was so special about James and John. I mean, in this Matthew, Mark, and Luke and the Synoptic Gospels, they're the first to be called. John's Gospel, a little bit different. They're the first to be called. Jesus goes along and he calls Peter, Andrew, and then James and John. But Andrew seems to slip away. He doesn't get much attention. Even in the Gospel of John, he is the one that brings Peter to Jesus. But he doesn't get much attention. But James and John do. In the transfiguration, which we had on Sunday, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to the high mountain and shows them his glory. So they seem to have some special preference. I've never been able to figure out why they were so preferred among the apostles. And so they have reason to think they're special, and they would ask Jesus to have these, one to be the Secretary of State and the other to be the Vice President of the new corporation, the new world that Jesus will found. Keep this in mind. The followers of Jesus are called to be servants. And the servant is somehow somebody who has humility, who will respect others, who will honor other people, who will put other people first. That's the whole call of the gospel. Sometimes a difficult enough uh, challenge for each and every one of us. Finally, I've often wondered, um, when they made a commitment to follow Jesus, what does that mean? If we make a commitment in marriage or in bonded friendship, does that mean we'll put the other person first? Does it mean we'll carry the cross the other person has? Uh, does it mean I have conditions, I have limitations? Does it really mean that I will put the other person first? I will be generous and forgiving and understanding? I mean, what does it mean when we make a promise in life as these, James and John made a promise to follow Jesus Christ. They said, yes, we will follow you. However, we have conditions. Keep that in mind. Following Jesus, we're not supposed to have conditions. Pause now for a moment of prayer.